Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And today we hope to do the concluding episode of our series titled Old Testament Pictures and Shadows uh, of the Jesus' Blood Atonement. Uh, if you haven't seen the previous uh, uh, programs, uh, they're available on my channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, and, uh, today we're going to tie it all up and do a recap. Uh, and uh, I'm expecting uh, Tanya, who is uh, Galaxy Dream 3, to join us any minute. Right now I have Brother Mitchell Belenkoff with me. <laughs> got another one, just, just as soon as you started talking. Yeah, and I, I have Brother Salam uh, Kamara from London, England, who just joined us. Uh, his channel is uh, Young Baptist 07. And Brother, I just did an introduction, and uh, you, you appear just in time to get introduced. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So nice to have you back with us. We've missed you. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a busy couple of weeks. So. Yes, we know you're a very busy young man. And and uh, uh, Mitch, uh, have you met Mitch? Uh, were you on the show with Mitch before? Mitch yes. Blanco? Yeah. Okay, so you know Mitch. Um, he's very busy too. He's going back to school and. And so uh, everybody's really busy but me, so I, <laughs> my schedule is pretty, pretty wide open and flexible. Um, but uh, so great to have you back. Uh, we're going to try to conclude this series today, and then we'll do a, a, a recap covering all the points very, very briefly, kind of just uh, a little reader, Reader's Digest uh, version of the whole thing. Um, okay. First, uh, oh, uh, for those of you who don't know, don't know uh, uh, Brother Salam, uh, his channel is Young Baptist 07, and I highly recommend you subscribe to his channel. He's a pure grace believer, and your video, his videos will be a blessing to you. And uh, Brother Mitchell Blankoff, uh, you've probably seen him on the last couple of episodes too. And, and uh, go to his channel, uh, subscribe, and you're going to learn some things from Mitchell that uh, never dawned on you before. <laughs> it will definitely be a blessing and uh, uh, enlightening. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to pick up where we left off last time, and then, as I said, we'll start from the beginning and recap everything. Right now, we want to talk about the uh, uh, sacrifices. Uh, they, they have two categories of sacrifices, the sweet savor sacrifices and the blood sacrifices. And... Uh, First, we got the, the, in the Old Testament, you have the burnt offering. And the burnt offering uh, is likened in the New Testament to Jesus' and our devotion to God. And let's go to Ephesians uh, 5, 1 and 2. I didn't prepare this in advance, so whoever finds it first, let me know. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. I'm looking it up. Hey, guys, is Ephesians the Old Testament or the New Testament? Ephesians, definitely old. <laughs> and he goes, you can't resist a chance to, to, to tease me. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Okay, I've got it here. It says, um, Be ye therefore followers of God, as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. So here we have the Apostle Paul who wrote the book of Ephesians comparing Jesus' sacrifice to this uh, Old Testament sweet savor sacrifice. Uh, so uh, anybody want to comment on that verse or this, what we've said so far? Well, contrasting that, that really shows you that, that our works, you know, that that was the responsibility of the, of the Old Testament uh, uh, believers, and now that, that, that sweet savor is in Christ. So basically that would say that our works, you know, are not what, what, what God looks at, but... But, but actually looks at us as the ones doing the good things for, 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 um, 
to 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 bring sweet savor to the to the nostrils of of of, of Hashem, God. Yeah, I was. Uh, your, I think you touched on it, but I'm wondering if anybody could tell me more about what the meaning of the term "sweet savor" means. Um, no, I mean the the Old Testament sacrifices. Um, you know, obviously gave off a, a sense which was uh, pleasing to the Lord because it speaks about this uh, similar um, in the Old Testament. So Christ being our sacrifice, our being our lamb, um, you know, this this is like a New Testament picture of the Old Testament sacrifice and that Christ fulfilled it. And it's a sweet smelling savor. Okay, uh, one thing we know we know very clearly is there's, we've already given many examples of, particularly of Paul, uh, looking back and citing Old Testament uh, scriptures about various things and then saying this is a picture or a shadow or a uh, likened to Jesus. So the idea that the Old Testament is full of pictures of Jesus and his blood atonement all through the Old Testament. We've given many examples and we'll recap them here at the end. But the Apostle Paul doesn't just uh, state something like, well, uh, this is what Jesus did. He, he very carefully points out the Old Testament and says, this is what the, old, the scriptures say, this is what Jesus did, and that's why the Old Testament was pointing to Jesus. Uh, let's, let's go to... Uh, now, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Okay. Okay. Anybody, everybody have it? Mm -hmm. Salam, you feel like reading that? Yeah, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, <clears throat> by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that's good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay. And uh, Romans, uh, of course, who wrote Romans? Uh, Paul. Yeah. So here we have Paul again uh, using the word of uh, sacrifice, let your bodies be a, a living sacrifice. So uh, the idea that uh, they did sacrifices in the Old Testament, and then Jesus was sacrificed uh, for our sins, and now here Paul is talking about letting our bodies be a living. What do you think it means to be a living sacrifice? Well, I'd say that it doesn't mean that the sacrifice that we that we make, or it doesn't it doesn't mean that the sacrifice is for our sins. Uh, that's I think I I would have to point that out first and foremost. But but this sacrifice is your service to God after and above or, or above and beyond. The, the atonement that was paid for you, your holy service to, the, to, to God, offering yourself up uh, a, a, as a servant and, a, and a, pleasing, a pleasing smelling aroma to, to, to God himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we always want to point out that uh, we never want to confuse any of the things that we do uh, uh, with uh, uh, the work of Christ that was finished so that we, we're not uh, trying to mix our works with Jesus' work. And, uh, our works are totally for a different purpose. Our works have nothing to do with attaining or uh, maintaining our salvation, or even proving our salvation. Uh, our works uh, are for a totally different purpose, as we discussed in previous studies. Uh, it's because we do works because we love God, because we love our fellow man, because we will receive treasures in heaven, and, and also because uh, 
uh, if we do good, we're going to uh, reap what we sow. And if we do bad, then God is going to spank us because we're his children. So those are the reasons we do these works. Uh, but looking at uh, uh, giving our life in service to our Savior uh, is what Paul calls a reasonable sacrifice. In other words, don't make your life all about what you want to do and just satisfying all of your desires. Make a sacrifice. Sometimes do things uh, for, the, for the service of God and for your fellow man. All right. Uh, well, the next point it would be grain offering. Uh, and that is giving back a contribution to God. Uh, so let's look at Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Okay. Um, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Oh, yeah. Is that a Bible? So this, uh, this really, I kind of jumped ahead with my last thought, and that's what we're talking about here, that the, uh, we're going to receive treasures, we do get rewards for our ministries, for our service, uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this is likened to the grain offering, which is giving back. We give back to God because we're blessed. Okay? Yeah. If anybody wants to elaborate further, let me know, and I'll go on to the drink offering. Uh, and that drink offering uh, was uh, likened to pouring out our life for God. Oh, and I forgot, wait, before we go on, I forgot, let's look at Romans 8 9. Okay. Romans 9? Sure. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, it makes me think of uh, the times where people are trying to uh, find some test uh, for to determine if, uh, if someone else is truly saved. Have you ever, guys ever encountered that? People who want to yeah. uh, point the finger at everybody and try to determine if that person is truly saved or not? Yeah. And, uh, you know, most people, it seems like they, they, the test to them is how that person is living their life. Uh, but the test to me, there's only two tests. Uh, the first test is... Uh, Paul says, test yourself whether you be in the faith. And to me, in the faith means my faith is in the right thing. My, the object of my faith is Jesus. So if, if to test myself whether I be in the faith, uh, I would ask someone, what are you basing your salvation on? On what grounds do you think you're going to have eternal life in heaven? And if they tell me, uh, I'm basing it entirely on Jesus Christ. He's my Savior. It's not based on anything I do. It's what he did in trusting him. Then, to me, they pass that test, that they're, they're in the prop, their faith is in the proper thing. And here it talks about, um, what was the verse again, 12? Uh, no, 9? 8, 12. Uh, yeah. The other test, the other Eight. test is well, we're Christians if we have the Holy Spirit living in us. But how can you tell if someone has the Holy Spirit living in you? I'd like to run to um, the same, it's like my same page here, uh, 6.14, Romans 6.14. It, it, it's like the crux of the issue. If you Actually, this, is, this section here 
is the is the major point of the Bible that, that, that brings home the whole truth right here. And it says, For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. So sin does not master you. Look, I'm not looking at the right verse here. Uh, you said, is it 14. Uh, Romans 8, 14? 6. 6. Oh, Romans 6, 14? 6, 14. Oh, man, I've got, I got myself. Okay, 6, 14. Okay, we were in chapter 8 before, but six, uh, Romans 6, 14. Yeah. For me, it's on the same page. So. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so we're, so we're at, for sin shall not be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. And the whole crux of the issue here, walking by the Spirit, is realizing you're no longer under the law. This is something that people don't understand when it comes to the test of faith. Faith in what? Faith in the idea that I am no longer un under the law because of Jesus Christ. That is what sets me free from the law of sin and death. And that is the true test in my play that I'm in the faith. That I believe that I am no longer under the law but under grace. And sin won't be my master anymore because I'm no longer under the law. So this whole walking by the Spirit and understanding what that means is that I can more walk in Christ more righteously, more righteously than those who are who believe that they have to do something in order to be saved. Because I know I don't need to do anything in order to be saved. Therefore, I can walk better at the law because there's no because I know that the law is not over me condemning me because Christ died for my sins. So this whole this whole crux of the issue is what sets us free to be able to worship and serve God. And that's the test to see, I believe, to see whether you're in the faith or not. Whether you're trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ. Because if it's the other way, the way other people make you test that you're in the faith, faith it's telling you how well are you obeying the law. Well, sin won't be my master as long as I know the love of Christ in my heart. And, and so that's, I mean, chapter 7 to me is the most perfect. When I read it over and over and over, and I understood it, it was the, it was the chapter that just set me and set my, my Christianity and my walk with God on fire. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's all, all true. Uh, so long, do you want to uh, comment on what Mitch said or this verse? No, I think, I think it's quite self-explanatory, and I mean... Um, Brother Mitch explained it uh, wonderfully. Uh, for sin shall not shall not have dominion over you, for you not under the law, but under grace. Because um, sin sin can only come because of the law. I mean, we break the law, therefore we have sinned. But we are under grace. Not saying that we're sinless, but to understand that um, there is one greater than us who has um, paid that price for sin and you know having that knowledge and that understanding should free us from this bondage I mean why why should we live in a way or, or why should we live as if we're dead when we've been given new life I mean it makes no sense you know so for sin I have no dominion over you Paul's saying it, sh it shouldn't have it's like a direct statement there's no there's no two ways about it. If if you're saved, why live like you're not saved? Yeah, right. why, why should you go back to the to, 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 to the style of living that you lived before? Yeah. Absolutely. Looking at seven though, I mean just looking at, at at Paul's example, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said do not covet, but sin. Seizing the opportunity afforded by the law, the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. So here it was that when I was given the command not to covet, sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life, and I died. Mm -hmm. and this is the whole idea that if you walk under the law, and this is what Paul was talking about, I try to do what is good, but every time I try to do what's good, I wind up doing what I can't do. 
Why? Because that's an example of you trying to walk by the law and not walk by grace. And so those who walk by the spirit of grace, the spirit that tells you you're no, under the, no longer under the law, will not gratify the sinful nature. And that's the crux of the issue. If you want your test to see whether or not you're controlled by the spirit and whether or not you're saved, you're not walking by the law and having problems like Paul was having, trying to do the law but not being able to attain it. But then finding that he can follow the law, and I'm not saying perfectly, but that he could follow the law in a, such a freedom because sin cannot seize the opportunity anymore more to ha put a whip over you to make you comply to sinful desires. You've been freed for that. From that, And this is why I read 6.14, For sin shall no, not be your master, because you are no longer under the law, but under grace. That's, that's what brings into perspective the whole idea that since we're not under the law, we're free to be holy. Now, um, the, I've heard a lot of people say uh, that they believe that uh, a person's works uh, prove that they're saved. And they'll say, um, "No, we we don't do uh, we don't uh, let me see we don't we're not saved because we do works." They say, "But but we we do works because we're saved." In other words, they they try to say that uh, this this is the connection. You don't have to do works to get saved, but a natural result of being saved is you will do good works. You will have a transformation. People will see a change in you, and then that they want to use that as a test uh, to evaluate whether someone's really saved. Um, and that is just as wrong as saying that uh, you've got to do works to get saved if you say that you've got to do works to prove you're saved. And what I, from my own experience, and what I think the Bible teaches, is that um, uh, yes, yes. Uh, a, a Christian, uh, we do we do good works, but we don't all do them to the same degree and as often. We're not clones. We're all unique individuals. And some people are going to uh, take this more seriously. This Holy Spirit lives inside us and prompts us to and wants to transform us. Some of us embrace that prompting, and we want to comply, and we want to give back like this uh, like this brain offering. We want to give back some of our time and some of our things in service to the God for, for our God because we, we we love what He did for us and we want to serve Him and be an ambassador. Uh, but we're we're not doing it. It's not not everybody takes this as seriously. Some people resist it greatly, and some people who are truly saved, you can't tell it at all by their lives. I'll give you my own. Personal example is that if people, if you knew me um, 30 years ago uh, and you and you compared me to who I am now, you'd wonder there's no similarity really. There, uh, he's a totally different person. But I'm not saying this to boast because uh, I I don't believe I made any of these changes. The changes that took place in me was God working on me and changing me, took changing my desires. Uh, and over time, he transformed me into a different person. Uh, so uh, Jesus did the work for our salvation. The Holy Spirit does the work in transforming us. Let's not take any credit for ourselves for working to get saved, and let's not take any credit for the fact that we've changed. If there is a change in us, it's the Holy Spirit that is working on us, and the only thing we can say is that... Um, uh, I'm going to embrace the Holy Spirit and, and want to and, and be happy that He's changing me instead of resisting it and wanting to continue to live like the devil as I did before. Hi, Tanya. You know, we're talking about different uh, types of offerings and comparing it to uh, uh, our Jesus and our walk. Uh, unless you want to say anything else about that, uh, we'll move on to this drink offering. Yeah, I actually do. Uh, okay. I think it's worth mentioning. Because, because of the other side of the issue. There will be lots of Christians that will have one verse stick out in their mind, and it's a pitfall. 
this verse is, you'll know them by their fruits. Mm -hmm. And I've actually answered people because they were like, well, well, they're, ju they're judging their fellow Christians by saying, well, you have to be in fruit inspectors, inspector. You have to know them by their fruits. But actually, that scripture, if anybody wants to bring it out, had to do with false teachers that were actually bringing you back under the law. They were Pharisees. Yeah. So, so this scripture, knowing them by their fruits, has nothing to do with, with judging your fellow man's Christian walk. It had to do with knowing the wolves that were in the church that were trying to Judaize you and bring you back under the law. So it turns out that that scripture was actually a very strong scripture in, 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 in an arsenal of uh, proving free grace. Whereas they tried to use this to say, well, no, we have to have lordship salvation. It does not. And absolutely, uh, absolutely this scripture proves that you need to, to, to run away from these wolves in sheep's clothing that would... That, and, and test them by their fruits. And what is this fruit that's a bad fruit? It's the law. They're giving you back the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. They're giving you back the same fruit that Adam and Eve ate the tree of. They're giving you back the law. Yeah, I think that you bring that, that up uh, is an important point to make because it is certainly misused. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, heresy uh, rests on the misuse of that verse. Another one that is a cousin to it is, uh, it's, I think it's in Matthew 23, and, and they said, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these mighty works in your name? And Jesus said, <laughs> me, workers of iniquity, I never knew you. These are people who are appealing to Jesus. Look at all the works that we did in your name. In other words, I, I said I'm a Christian, and I did all these works in your name, and they're trying to be justified because of the work that they did. And Jesus answers them, Depart from me, worker of iniquity. In other words, the works that they did, uh, Jesus gives them no credit for it because they're trying to base their salvation on their own work instead of the work that he did. So here you have two verses, two cases, where it actually says the exact opposite of the works, lordship, salvation premise on those two verses. Absolutely. Brother Salam, I know you've got something to say about this. Uh, yeah, um, you know, this, uh, those verses in Matthew chapter 7 have been used uh, many times in the past to, yeah, to prop up this, this idea that, um, you know, um, it's, it's talking about Christians, but what, um, oh, it's talking about, you know, knowing a believer by their fruits, but um, as Mitchell pointed out, uh, in context, this is talking about false teachers, and, um, you know, um, it, it talks about here about trees and about how trees bring forth different fruits and so on and so forth. And Jesus begins in verse 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. So Jesus prefaces this whole section with those words, you know, therefore kind of nullifying this idea that um, you have to go around expect uh, um checking the fruit of other believers to know, okay, if they're saved or not. Now, now the Word of God says every believer will be chastened by the Lord if they stray away, and of course that we know for sure, but um, for me to go around and say, well, this person's a Christian and that person's a Christian because, you know, they do this or they do that, um, that's, that's cheapening um, salvation and making it seem like it's a work, you know, kind of viewing it through those lens. So, um, yeah, I, I agree with those statements. And, um, yeah. the, um, uh, the, these are both examples of the, the principle. You've probably heard this before. A, a text taken out of context is a pretext. Yeah. So, so someone, a person who is a Lordship, work salvationist believer, uh, they have a pretext, they have a preset uh, idea, and they want to take this verse and make it twisted to make it mean to support their viewpoint. But if you look at the whole verse in with uh, within a couple of paragraphs before and after, you see that the context says nothing like what they're representing it to mean. 
Yes, Tony. I just wanted to kind of keep going with what Salam was saying and say that, um, uh, and I know this more than anybody right now, I think it was very smart of God, of course, because he's like the smartest guy in the world, um, <laughs> to, you know, he did tell us to, to look for fruit, right? But Mitch was right. Um, it, it was talking about, like, the gospel, though, like, as far as um, false gospels and to look out for that because, and the reason I say this is because even good fruit can be misleading, and we know this, you know? All the Muslims, look at look at them. I mean, they they're some of the most devout, good people in the world, but they're wrong. So, you know, we're supposed to look at the fruit, yeah, but we're supposed to also look at what they're saying, too, and that is the most important thing, not the fruit. Yeah. The gospel, what they say is is the truth, is what's the most most important thing to look at, not the fruit. So I just agree. Well, it's true. That I, I, yeah, I, I agree that the that 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 uh, you know that there's tons of 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 sections or factions of religion that do good works. As a matter of fact, most every religion does good works. But the fruit here brings us into bondage. The law always brought us into bondage, and this is what Peter was talking about when when he said, "Why why bring why bring bring uh, these Gentiles under a, a yoke that we we uh, we Jews couldn't uh, burden that we Jews couldn't bear ourselves? So so yeah, defining this fruit and, and what's bad about the fruit about of of, of legalism, um, it wasn't I, I guess it, it wasn't expounded upon in the in the verse, but the the idea of the inspection of the fruit here is is inspecting to see if the fruit actually brings you freedom, liberty, or bondage. And this fruit, the fruit of the law, brought, brought us bondage, whereas the fruit of the knowledge of good, uh, uh, the fruit of Jesus Christ on the cross, is the tree of life that set us free to liberty. Mm -hmm. Can I just say one more thing? Yeah. I'm sorry. I just love talking to you guys because we just feed off of each other. But you're right, and the fruit should always point to the tree, and that tree being Jesus Christ. Exactly. And so, if their fruit is good, but it's not pointing to that tree. Then it's wrong, and it's that simple. Amen. Amen. Yeah, very good. <laughs> very good saying. Now, remember, I talked about context, so I'm going to bring this right back to the context of this study. And we're talking about the grain offering, and the, the, I cited two a verse in Matthew, one in Romans. Uh, the idea of the grain offering is simply that okay, uh, we've been blessed, and now we want to give back in appreciation, show our appreciation to God. Uh, it has nothing to do with earning our salvation. Grain offering is like showing your appreciation. Now we're going to move on to the, to the drink offering, and it's likened to pouring out our life for God. And let's look at Luke 22:20. 20. Okay. Uh, who wants to read that? I can read it. Okay. It says, uh, Luke 22, 20, Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Okay. So the, uh, the idea is uh, pouring out our life for God. Well, first, Jesus poured out his life for us. That's the first thing we can understand. And so this drink offering in the Old Testament was uh, the idea that uh, in appreciation to God, let's pour out our life. And, and uh, um, it's similar to the grain offering in that let's uh, kind of appreciation, you know, sacrifice some of our time. Like the, the, the burnt offering, the grain offering, the sac drink offering, we're all talking about what we do in appreciation to God. Uh, okay, let's go to Philippians 2.16. While you're looking at that, can I just say something real quick? Yeah. Uh, when I was reading, that's a great verse. 
I mean, wow. But I just wanted to, to let people know that when it says um, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, that testament, that means covenant, which is interest, you know, important to know. So it's like this, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Mm -hmm. so I just want the people who don't know what testament means, that it means covenant. I thought that was pretty cool. Well, there's also a verse in, in the book of Hebrews where uh, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. I believe Paul said that uh, uh, a testament cannot happen until the death of the testator. Oh. So the idea that, uh, that of the New Testament, that for the New Testament to begin, there had to be a death of the testator. And Jesus was the testator, the one that would give us, uh, you know, it's his will, his, his last will and testament. So when he died, that's when the last will and testament actually goes into effect. It doesn't go into effect while, well, if you have a last will and testament, Tanya, Tanya nothing, it doesn't apply to anybody. Nobody gets anything from it until your death. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so the the New Testament begins with the death of the testator at the cross when Jesus died. The New Testament kicked in because that blood was the cup that was referred to here, the cup of his his blood that was shed for for us. Um, now, as I said before, I, I I believe that there's really only two things. People want to have all these dispensations. I've seen as many as seven of them different uh, commentaries, and uh, I believe there's really just two. Uh, in the past, they look to the future for God to provide a solution to the problem, providing sal salvation, and that's what we've done in this whole study. is talked about all these examples of blood being shed, pointing to the future time when blood would be shed, and the perfect blood be shed, so that we really have a real solution to the problem. Jesus died for our sins. They look forward to that. And all these Old Testament examples we've reviewed are pictures of this future blood sacrifice. And then now that it's happened, all of us now, we look back uh, to that event. So in the, in, the, in the Old Testament, they look forward to this blood sacrifice, and we have faith looking back, saying, it is accomplished, it's finished. Uh, now, what was the next one? We do Philippians... Philippians uh, 2.16. Uh, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Uh, truth is, from this outline I'm using, I don't know how that verse applies to this. Is, can anybody see the connection between this drink offering pouring out our life for God? Uh, oh, I guess I can see it now. Talking about laboring laboring, uh, and whether our labor is in vain or not. Oh, yeah. I think, I think if you look at the, the beginning of the, of, um, therefore, my dear friends, you have, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but in, in much more in, in my absence, it's about how you do your service to God. Do everything without cl complaining or arguing. See, it's not, I mean, it's not as if we're going, I mean, God is going to, going to discipline us if we don't serve out our life in a way that's pleasing to him. But, and this is why he, he talks about the, 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 um, the Israelites being punished for, for backbiting and for, or for complaining while they were in the desert. But we don't have to worry about if, if we do backbite or complain. I mean, God will discipline us, but by no means will he take our salvation away. And a lot of people use that verse in Philippians or the verses in Philippians to say that, well, the, the, you know, be, be afraid, you know, be fearful. Well, you should be fearful. But this whole idea of the way we walk as we're being persecuted, because Paul was persecuted in many ways, 
but in every way that he was persecuted, he did it in such a way to shine light and glory on Jesus Christ and not to make him look like a complainer or a backbiter. So that this way it would be an accept acceptable sacrifice unto heaven. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody want to add to that before I go on to the fellowship offering? No. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, I just said no. Oh, okay. Uh, so we've, we've talked about the burnt offering, the grain offering, the drink offering. Now we move to the fellowship offering, and that's like into celebrating our blessings from God. And let's look at John 10.10. 10. Uh, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Well, this is kind of a tricky point here. But uh, it uh, says that this fellowship offering is, is celebrating our blessings from God. And this example talks about Jesus saying that he came to give us life more abundantly. Not only to give us eternal life, but to give us an abundant life. Uh, do you think that applies to now or are in eternity? Well, no. Just, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I've gone. Go ahead, Mitch. Oh, um, I'm just looking at, of course, I read... I go back verses and forward verses to see what the context of, of, of what he was speaking about. And, of course, he's rebuking the, the Pharisees at this point who said that, 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 that are, are, you, are, are you saying we're blind? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, you claim you can see, your guilt remains. I tell you the truth, the man who, who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate in other words, through Jesus Christ. Therefore, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. And all who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Um, so, so I would say that, 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 that if we look at the context here, is, it, it, uh, I'm just looking at it as say, saying that he will give us life and more abundantly, but only he will. Not, not, not these these blind guides or these or these ones these that came to destroy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Again, uh, thank you for bringing context. It, uh, really, he's making the point that, that only he, only he. That's the whole subject of this. He's talking about the exclusivity of salvation only through him. Uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So uh, this idea that uh, there, there are other ways to achieve eternal life through various religions or, or personal merit or whatever, Jesus makes it very clear in saying that uh, he is the exclusive door, the only way. So you either have to accept that and be saved, or you have to call Jesus a liar or a lunatic, as C.S. Lewis said. He's either a liar or a lunatic or... Or Lord, Savior. <laughs> uh, but the idea that, but let's get back to this point about the fellowship offering and the blessings. And uh, do you think Jesus here is talking about giving us more of life more abundantly? Um, is, is he talking about in, in our eternal state or, or our uh, worldly state now, uh, an abundant in life? I think it means here now, obviously, because. Once, once we're in our spiritual in in our spiritual state, we are there. Abundantly wouldn't even apply because that would uh, assume that there would be more of something. And once we're in heaven and stuff, there is no more. I mean, it's perfect perfection. It's there is no more. So I think it means here on this earth in this life. Well, I, I think that uh, you're, you're right in a sense. And that uh, uh, I've often said, 
that uh, I would be happy being the poorest man in heaven. You know, uh, there was a was there saying, do, uh, do you want to be a uh, be a, a servant of the Lord, or do you want to be a, the ruler rule with Satan? You know, that's what some people want to do. They, they think, well, if I'm with Satan, I get to rule with, with uh, Jesus. I have to be a servant. But uh, I, I would rather be uh, poor in heaven. The poorest person in heaven is going to be more blessed than anybody ever in all of history. Uh, and, but the point I'm making here, Tanya, is that uh, we're not going to all be equal in heaven. You know, uh, uh, yeah, it's going to be wonderful for everybody, but that's the whole point of the Bema Seat uh, and, and our ministries is that we're going to have different either treasures or maybe a status or roles in our in our eternal uh, ministries. Uh, I don't necessarily understand it all, but I do believe that uh, there's going to be a difference. I, I believe Salam is going to probably have a lot more treasures than me. You know. I guess He's, that I see what you're saying, and. You know? That we can kind of look at angels to get a feel for that, I guess. Now that I think about it, because different angels had different statuses as well. There were some that were more—I uh, mm -hmm. don't know if "powerful" is the right word, but mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying. They had different no. uh, duties or jobs or whatever. So yeah, I see what you're saying. <coughs> but I, yeah, I do, even in that perfection. I, so. I do think you're correct, though. Applying this verse to our uh, being blessed in this life uh, here and now. Uh, but my, I had a guy come to my Bible study years ago, a young man, and he was making the point that uh, uh, Jesus came to give us life and give it more abundantly. We were supposed to have an abundant life. Basically, he was really pushing the idea of like a prosperity gospel. Like, you know, if you have enough faith and you do the good works, you're going to be blessed and you'll be healed and you'll be wealthy and all that stuff. And and I said, well. Uh, the, the example I would give you is explain the Apostle Paul to me. Tell me who worked more and did, did more for Jesus than, than Paul, and then tell me about the blessings of his abundant life. He had an abundance of uh, abundant life, but he had abundance of being whipped and, and stoned and shipwrecked and so on and so on. Paul ran down the list uh, of all the things that he had endured because of his ministry, and so, if that's an Paul had an abundant life, but an abundance of uh, persecutions. Yeah, good point. Hmm. Uh, but I do think we should celebrate. I think this this fellowship offering is uh, the idea of of celebrating that we are blessed by God. And uh, I meet a lot of people. Your typical person is pretty negative in life, really, uh, whether they're Christian or not. Uh, I ask people how are you all the time, and they say, "Oh, not bad, or okay, or you know, I'm, 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 I'm um, above ground, something like that." <laughs> and most people do not appreciate, it's particularly in this country. I mean, I can understand people who live in a country where they're, they're pushing over tree stumps, stumps to find termites to eat. You know, uh, they, they they may have a negative attitude, and it's justified. But, but for most of the people we know, we should be nothing but be, be praising God and thanking Him for the blessings we have constantly, because we are so blessed. And um, uh, So, yeah, we, we're, we're blessed, and this fellowship offering is, is the idea of uh, uh, celebrating these blessings. Well, it's celebration, though. To, you know, I have life more abundantly, not, not with money, not with not having any troubles in my life, but when I was when when God took the, the took me and opened up my eyes and took the heart of stone out and put in the heart of flesh, immediately I had life. I had life in that more abundantly because before I was dead in my sins and transgressions and I had no hope. So life more abundantly for me would have started immediately when I when when I found when I when I when I was saved, and then it only gets better from there. But doesn't mean that my life will get any better. But the joy of my salvation and the fellowship with other saints that are also saved is a joy. To just sit and talk to everybody else 
and fellowship in our salvation is what I would say a fellowship offering or, or, or sharing fellowship with those who are saved also would be. Yeah, if we that's a very good point. If we even look at the name of it, the fellowship offering, let's not lose sight of the title. The title should describe it, and it's talking about the fellowship offering. And then what we're doing right now maybe is having a fellowship offering as we, we have fellowship uh, and uh, study together and we celebrate what God has done for us, uh, this could be a kind of a form of this fellowship offering. Yeah. First Thess Let's go to First Thessalonians 5.16. <laughs> Be joyful always. <laughs> <laughs> Rejoice evermore. <laughs> Rejoice evermore. Wow. I guess, uh, you know what they say? I've always heard that the uh, the shortest verse in the Bible is... Uh, is Jesus, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. <laughs> Jesus wept. But this one is equal to it, I guess. There's only two words. Re Rejoice evermore. Yeah, I, I thought of the Jesus wept verse when I saw this too. I was like, hey, this is a short one too. Yeah. <laughs> Rejoice evermore. And it gets it gets back to the point I was just talking about. Is that, um, almost every time I meet someone, or even someone that knows me already, they always say, well, how are you? How are you doing? And I, I normally say one of two things. I, I'll say, I'm fantastic. Because I really don't understand how fantastic I really am. Not me because of my attributes, but because of my blessings. I understand how blessed I am. I'm, I'm, what is it? Rejoicing evermore. Constantly, always knowing how blessed I am. Uh, uh, but uh, you're, as I said, it's to me it's one of the sad things in life is people not counting their blessings. I've made a video, I think, called Title Count Your Blessings. It's just, uh, it would be a worthwhile exercise for everybody to do this. Just get a piece of paper, start writing down every blessing you've got. Even the, the tiniest little thing that you've got food in your refrigerator for tonight. You've got a roof over your head tonight, or whatever it is. And, and, and you could go on and on and on. I'm free to, to uh, uh, worship and, and not be persecuted for my religion, you know, my faith. Uh, the fact that we can use this internet and we can talk all together all over the world. I mean, if you really think about it, how many things could you put down on that list of your blessings that you should be rejoicing over right now? And if you if you make that list, how could you possibly be negative or in any kind of despair if you put it in perspective and say, look, I just wrote down 500 blessings and I oh sure I've got three problems in my life, but I got 500 blessings and that's all I thought of just now. Yeah, and you know what else is we we can our 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 troubles are blessings too, especially if you have a pretty good strong faith, uh, and that comes as you grow and whatever. But you'll see that even your troubles, you'll expect the blessing to come from it because it will, because God is good all the time. So yeah. Romans eight twenty eight. Yes, I, uh, I I know why you said that too. You've had some personal experience with that. Yeah, we are, hopefully we all will grow and be blessed from even our troubles. Uh, okay, now we're going to move on to uh, what's called the, the blood sacrifices, and one of them is called a sin offering. Uh, the Jews made a sin offering, and uh, and looking at that, we see this as uh, uh, Jesus is our sin offering. His death was a sacrifice for our sins. Let's go to 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Okay, whoever finds it first can read it. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I would say that we could. How many verses do you think we could find that say that, that say the same thing, saying declaring that Jesus' death is the blood sacrifice for our sins? I know well, a lot. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of verses that clearly state it. Uh, so uh, here in the Old Testament, they had a sin offering that was uh, blood was shed. So that, uh, but it was it didn't really serve the purpose as it says in Hebrews. It didn't really work, but it was really pointing to the the blood sacrifice in the future that really would work. You know. Yeah, wasn't the um the verse we just read Luke twenty twenty two was that what it was? Uh, he straight up said that, you know, he he straight up said that. Yes. So. Yes. Okay. So, uh, now let's go to 2 Corinthians 5.21. Anybody got it? When he hath made him to be sin for us, he knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, here's another one. Uh, and, uh, as I said, I believe I believe we could, uh, if we really just made it our uh, goal to list every verse that talks about J Jesus uh, being this, His death being the atonement for our sins, uh, we could probably find uh, at least, what do you think, 20 or more? That clearly stated. Don't, not, I'm not talking about alluding to, but I'm mean just clearly stated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, so now we go uh, and remember, keeping in mind that the, the whole point of this this study is to look at things in the Old Testament and see how, uh, looking back, we can see what it really meant. Because now we have the benefit of hindsight. We, we know the finished work of, of Jesus. We, we know what it means. And now we can look back at these things like the sin offering and the guilt offering and all these things that we've been discussing and see their real meaning. Because uh, as Paul said, as, as Brother Scott likes to say a lot, oh, Brad, Scott couldn't be here because he had a difficult last couple of days, so he'll be with us next week. Uh, but uh, he, they, they love to talk about how these things have been hidden in time. Yeah, they're hidden, but now we have the benefit of looking back and we can see it clearly. Back then, they, they, they couldn't really, didn't really get it, what it all meant. Now let's look at the guilt offering. Uh, oh, did we do the 2 Corinthians 5.21 yet? Yep. Okay. Uh, let's do the, uh, the guilt offering. That's Matthew 5.23, 24. Oh. Hmm. What verse is that? Verse? One more time. Uh, Matthew five twenty three. Five twenty three to twenty four. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's a. Uh, this says here the guilt offering is uh, the point was maintaining a relationship with one another. Uh, so this verse here, talk, Jesus is instructing us on one. Jesus makes basically makes the point that your offerings really don't really mean anything. They don't have any value in the sight of God um, uh, on, on it, based on its own merit, you know, its own, uh, based on itself. Uh, it's your, in, uh, if you go to, no matter what you give as an offering, it doesn't really mean anything if you still have a problem between your brother 
And uh, you better clear that up first. That is more important to God than you making some kind of offering or sacrifice. Yeah. And this is very good Jewish teaching, by the way. As a matter of fact, uh, th this is, uh, this is um, uh, talks about um, almost like the Jews before the new year starts. With the Jewish people, the year is very important. Because the sacrifices were, and, and, and the counting of Omer had to do with them having a good year. So if they had something against their brother before the year started, Yom Kippur, they would have what's called a Shvatayar, which was which meant a bad year. So so it was very important for them to be that you weren't angry with them. If you had anything they would ask you, do you have anything against me? Is there anything I've done wrong? Because they were praying very hard so that they would be good enough to have a good year coming up. Uh, so, so uh, this whole idea of, of not having your brother be angry at, at you, at you whatsoever, is 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 is, is steeped in, in 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 the Jewish idea. But also, it's also when you think about it, uh, uh, the day of the day of atonement, which was Christ's sacrifices and its blood. It's where they missed the point completely that Jesus is the one that reconciled us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there's something, uh, I, I've never been a member of uh, AA, uh, but I've seen a lot of movies that have people going to AA and the, the 12 steps and stuff, so I, I believe they have one step is where you've got to go to everybody you've wronged and do something to apologize or uh, make it right. And it, it seems to me that's a, that's a good principle and that's that's really what is, Jesus is pointing out here. He says, you're don't make any sacrifices to God thinking God wants your sacrifice until you first cleared up the problem with your brother. Clear that up first, and then God will be happy to receive your sacrifices, you know? Very good point. Um, now, uh, let's move on to the festivals of the Jews. Um, now, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven festivals. I'm going to mention it and just see if anybody can identify the uh, the the uh, ty the type of the how it applies to to Christ, a okay, Passover. Absolutely, that's easy. That's 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 the blood covering us or covering the firstborn, actually, which means those are the inheritance. The blood didn't cover everybody. It, it was that the firstborn of every home would not be destroyed by the killing angel. The firstborn being those who were to inherit. And so Christ is, is, is a covering sacrifice for all his who are firstborn or those who will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Okay, I, I hope that uh, uh, we keep in mind that some people who are going to watch this may not be that familiar with the historic the historicity of, of the Passover. So I think we ought to just get lay a little foundation so they know what this Passover was, and then we can t explain how it uh, is a picture of Christ. Well, there's a lot there. Um, of course, we had the Israelites who were in slavery. They had to make bricks without straw. They were in slavery under the Egyptians, the Egyptian pharaoh, and Moses was sent by a burning bush, basically, <laughs> but by God, <laughs> to to deliver the people from bondage, from slavery, and so, so of course, Moses goes to the Pharaoh, the slave, and goes, "Yo, set my people free," <laughs> and Pharaoh goes, "Are you nuts?" <laughs> I need you guys to make bricks. I got to make my sphinx. I've got to make my. I've got to make my grave site. I've got to put up my pyramids. You guys are working. So 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 Moses comes back and says, "Look, you better set us free." And finally, finally, he starts sending plagues at them. And by the way, every one of those plagues was against one of the false gods. So basically, all of those plagues that were sent, and these plagues were sent, the plagues of flies and frogs, and they, they sent, the, the, the river was, was full of blood. Each one of them 
represented one of their Egyptian gods, saying that this god, the true god, is the true god, and you're to worship him only, and he beats all of your gods. Finally, the last plague was that Pharaoh had said, I will strike all of your firstborn and destroy your people. And Moses said, that's back on you. God's going to destroy God. The destroying angel is going to destroy all of your, your firstborn. But it was all of the firstborn in the whole country. So even Egyptians and Israelites would have been destroyed by that killing angel if it wasn't for the lamb that Moses was instructed to slay and the lambs that had blood that was to be put, all the lambs, bloods that were supposed to be put over the doorposts signifying that this house is the house of somebody who is first born, somebody who is elected or, or, or somebody who is covered by the blood. And this lamb's blood is reminiscent of the blood of Christ. And so now we have, uh, even if an Egyptian put blood over their door, from the Lamb, that would signify that they were trusting in the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. They would have been saved. Of course, none of them did that. But that was what delivered the people. The blood of the Lamb over the doorpost delivered the people out of Israel. And so we look at the blood of Jesus Christ shed for us on the cross. He's the Lamb that takes away our sins. And He is our Passover Lamb, sacrificed on the Passover the same day to show us the way out and to save us from slavery to sin and destruction and the killing angel. Okay. And that was very, good enough. Yeah, that, that's a very, very good foundation. And uh, he just he just spoke in uh, uh, New Modern Mitchell Balenka translation. <laughs> Yo, Jack, <laughs> we got to get out of here. <laughs> Okay, a couple of questions here. Is that uh, you said a lamb had to be slain? I know that John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and behold, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. So we know this lamb is a picture of Jesus who is to be sacrificed. Uh, but what kind of a lamb was it that they needed? The lamb. A lamb that was. It had to be a male lamb, without spot or blemish. A first, a first thing of the flock. I'm trying to remember. I'm not in Exodus chapter 12, so I'm just going by memory. Okay. So, uh, but without spot or blemish, what does that represent? It means it was it was perfect in the sense that it had no um, deformities. It had no um, can condition which which would make it. Um, Odd, just like how Christ, he was sinless. He had no imperfections in him that uh, you would call sin, you know, because, yeah. Because Jesus, the, the lamb originally had to be without spot or blemish because Jesus himself was without any sin, without spot or blemish on him, no sin on Jesus, until yeah. our sins were put on him. And then, and then let me ask you about this blood. Um, when they applied the blood to this door so that, so that the, the, the death angel would pass over that house and not kill the firstborn, that's why it's called Passover. But, but how was this blood applied? And is there any significance in that? I believe I heard it. Go, oh, go ahead. No, go on. Sorry. No, I, I just in it, almost in the, the uh, to the sides and to the top, like a cross, as far as I, I I've heard said. Yeah, uh, some people liken it to the sign of the cross, as a Catholic does, uh, in in those positions. But the way I like to look at it is, it was applied on the top uh, above the door on the cross beam in the center. And then it was applied on each corners on the side, uh, and then it would drip down from the center onto the floor. Uh, so it was a picture 
of Jesus on that cross having that the blood on his head, the blood on his hands, and the blood on his feet. A picture of the cross. And so uh, just as the death angel passed over those who had this uh, blood uh, that would, would save them, uh, we are passed over. All of us, all of us who trust in Jesus as our Savior, we're passed over from judgment and condemnation because uh, we have this blood covering us. And, and, uh, so we are passed over. Uh, we're not condemned. Uh, the Bible says, whosoever believeth in the Son, Jesus Christ, uh, uh, hath life. Whoever believeth not in the Son uh, shall not have life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So we're spared the wrath of God. We're spared. Uh, it says, uh, if you believe on Jesus, you're not condemned. If you do not believe in Jesus, you are condemned already. So we we are spared condemnation. We're spared wrath because of this co blood covering that we have uh, from Jesus. Uh, so that's the Passover, and uh, it's amazing to me that so many Jews do not see the the obvious connection here. Now let's move on to uh, the next uh, festival. It's called First Fruits. And what would the first fruit, fruits the Jews celebrate be a picture of relating to Christ? Well, I'd have to go back in, into, the, into it. Uh, first fruits, um, I'm, I'm just looking at that. Um, the 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 harvest time is this the time when when uh, they bring in the 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 and uh, it's a picture of I believe the saints actually be coming into the kingdom for, uh, through Jesus Christ. Um, there's a period of time called where they're counting Omer, and then you have the feast of weeks or booths uh, where you come into this tabernacle. The tabernacles come, so this is another. Idea where they bring the the the, the lil of the the estrog and the and the, what's it the uh, it's a uh, willow branch a myrtle branch and and estrog is bringing fruits in there and praying. So um, as far as I see, if you look at the feast of Pentecost, which is weeks, I'm pretty sure that that has to do with the harvest, and what the harvest is the harvest of heaven, the us coming into the or the fruit of. And what's the what's the word for that, brother? You know what? It's it's slipping my mind right now because uh, <laughs> that's the resurrection. Yeah. The resurrection. The resurrection. Yeah. Here you go. Yeah. First fruits. Jesus was the first fruit. He's the first uh, first to be resurrected. Now we know that Lazarus was resurrected, and we know that uh, what was the young girl's name? Uh, Tabitha. Dorcas. Mark. Dorcas. Dorcas. Tabitha. Yeah. Uh, but they were resurrected to life to die again. Jesus is the only one who has been resurrected to never die again. He's the first. That's representing the first fruits. Uh, but then we know that following the first fruits, you have the whole harvest, and that's the resurrection of the saints. And that's what you and I, we all have to look forward to, is that we are going to be resurrected into a glorified body, an eternal life body with, uh, that will never die again, just as Jesus had his resurrection. Now that, let's look at the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay, so what, what is that a picture of in the New Testament, the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Remember why they why the he had this feast of unleavened bread. What happened? Well, they had to leave hastily. <laughs> yeah. They had to leave before the bread had a chance to rise. <laughs> yeah. Yes. When when the when the Pharaoh said, "Well, let the people go," man, they left. Every, every they were ready, and they left on the spur of the moment. And uh, yeah, they didn't wait for the, the the bread to rise. And so now that they, they use uh, unleavened bread. To represent this event uh, that uh, being free 
they were set free, but they needed to leave immediately. And leaven, leaven is also symbolic of, of, of what? Uh, pride. Pride, sin. sin, and also false doctrine. You can find examples in, in the, the New Testament of leaven being referred to at all of all those things. So now let's, let's go on to the um, Feast of Weeks, which is Pentecost. There we go. And uh, what is this a picture of? We should know. Uh, in the Old Testament, what what, what was Pentecost all about? And then we know what Pentecost is about the New Testament. But can anybody tell me about old, the Pentecost of the Old Testament? The Pentecost in the Old Testament was the 50 days immediately after the resurrection. Um, and yeah, it was a time... Oh, everything escapes me at, at this time in the night. But it was... It was 50 days marked the... Pentecost marked the 50 days after the resurrection. And um, I think it was a time of feasting or observation. Mm -hmm. Can someone fill in the blanks for me? Yeah, um, I don't... Uh, I or, think or, or maybe I'm just wrong. Or maybe it was 40 days. No, it was 50 days. It was seven weeks. That's why they call it the Feast of Weeks. Seven times seven is 49. And then the next day, um, basically made 50. When you, when you, when you, when you uh, look at the... Um, uh, look at the, the the coming of the Holy Spirit. And I was sp talking about uh, uh, the harvest before. Well, th this counting of Omer, and this is the time of the year up until the up until Pentecost. Um, you had Sukkot, which is tabernacles, which is a picture of them being in the desert for all that time, and then being delivered. So. Um, um, in the Old Testament, it, it, it's I think I believe it, you know, and I'm I'm dicey on this too because I, I I'm shooting from the hip. It's been a while since I did a study on this, but the 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 time in the desert and then the deliverance of uh, uh, into the promised land, and um, uh, that would be Joshua um, entering uh, the the people entering in the promised land. So it was the the time in the desert. But it also has to do with the the uh, the counting of over Omer was the 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 harvest the coming of the harvest, which it would be synonymous with with them going into the promised land because we are the harvest that come, that goes into heaven. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I don't have any notes on the Pentecost applying how it's applied in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, what what do we know about Pentecost? That was. Um, go ahead, Salam. Go ahead, Salam. No, go ahead, Mitch. You talk. Oh, I'm always. I feel like. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah. Well, that, of course, that was the day that that uh, the Holy Spirit came and the and they started speaking in in the tongues of uh, of different nations that people understood them. And this was the the. The harvest again, if you will, of the Holy Spirit going out and and calling to the nations to come into the come into Christ or come into the Promised Land. It was the coming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, mm -hmm. So so that's when, uh, of course, they um, Peter got up and said, "We're not drunk. It's nine o'clock in the morning." But what this is is this is the the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and what you're hearing is, of course, the gospel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we know Pentecost is the day that the Holy Spirit came. Now we know that the Holy Spirit um, um, filled uh, David in the past, filled other uh, Old Testament saints, and it filled even the apostles. Jesus would breathe into them and give them power uh, and dwell with the Holy Spirit. But there was there was never the uh, uh, the baptism or the the, the uh, Feeling of the Holy Spirit that happened in, in Pentecost until that that event. That's when the Holy Spirit came and not only indwelled these believers, but they were sealed 
forever with the Holy Spirit as a child of God, uh, never to lose this relationship and their salvation for any reason. And that happened at Pentecost. Uh, so I've heard people argue different times for the church, beginning of the church. And uh, some people say that the church began at the, the cross. Now, I say that the, church, the, the cross was not the beginning of the church. The, the cross is what removed the sin barrier so the church could come into existence. Uh, so the sin debt was paid at the cross, but there were still uh, no Christians. Because remember what we established earlier at the very beginning to today? That the test of a, a Christian is that the Holy Spirit lives in them, right? So they couldn't have been in Christians or as far as the body of Christ and, and uh, the church. They couldn't have been until the Holy Spirit came to live inside them permanently. And that happened at Pentecost. Now, other people would argue that the church didn't begin until the Apostle Paul got saved. Which these are the hyper dispensationalists, and they say that uh, no, Pentecost that that wasn't the church, uh, and uh, uh, Peter and, and John and they are they weren't even Christians. And only Paul was the first Christian, and uh, so uh, obviously that to me is ridiculous. But I, I believe that Pentecost is the beginning of the church. That's when the Holy Spirit first came and indwelled the believers permanently, not just a temporary time to do a work in them, but now lives in us forever. Does anybody want to elaborate on that more or, or uh, uh, correct me? Well, that's interesting. But the, if you parallel what happened with Moses, where they were, the Passover happened and they went through the, 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 the parting of the Red Sea, right? But that was under Moses, but remember, they were still under blood. So Moses is the one that threw the Ten Commandments down. He was the one that represented the law. But realized that the blood covered them, so, so, so this idea of the law was that the blood, even though Moses was, was leading them out, it was the blood that, that led, the, that led the, 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 the firstborn out. But then they were in the desert, and under the law, walking walking in the desert for so many years, 40 years in the desert. Their shoes never wore out. But it was only the faithful, the next generation, that actually was led into the Promised Land through Yeshua, which is another name for Jesus. Now we look at the feasts of, um, of weeks, and, the, and the, the seven weeks or whatever time, and then the the, the, the pouring out of the Spirit into the nations. So there seems to be some sort of um, parallel between that time in the desert and the, 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 those weeks before the harvest time. Um, so we have Christ that died on the cross representing the, the Passover, and then we have the weeks of time representing the, the ushering in of the kingdom. Yeah, the, uh, I, I read something about this very point you're making here that the, uh, the the Passover was the blood so that they could be free. The 40 years in the wilderness was likened to our lives. Once we get saved, we still have to live in this world, and it's a journey in the wilderness of our lives until we finally get to the promised land, and that promised land is our uh, resurrection and eternal life in heaven. So, uh, yeah, what you've come up with there is something that I, I've read before. And it, and it makes perfect sense, but, but, but also remember that when Joshua went into the land, that's when, they, when Christianity, or not Christianity, but Judaism took over the, the land. Joshua conquered after that. Mm -hmm. And the kingdom of Jesus Christ conquered the world afterwards. Mm -hmm. So we see that, 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 that at Pentecost, was this time when the Holy Spirit was poured out and the gospel was starting to be preached out to the nations, to the Gentiles. And the, the gospel basically, like Joshua's or Yeshua's rule, took over or was spread throughout the world. And, and so, um, so now we, we, if we look at Moses, the desert, 
Joshua and then Joshua's campaign to take over the promised land and we look at the gospel being preached through after Pentecost the Holy Spirit being poured out on the land being poured out unto the nations and then the gospel now spreading likening to Joshua Yeshua and his ministry or his well Judaism at the time spreading or God or 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 or, or the kingdom spreading mm -hmm. to fill the promised land and then Christ's kingdom being preached out into the nations and then finally of course we will be and and own the promised land which will be in heaven as as it's ushered in so we see from parallels of the Old Testament to the New Testament Christianity kind of following the path of Moses the years in the desert and Joshua and the 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 the, the spread of Judaism compared to Christ the Holy Spirit the nations being preached to and spread throughout the world and then ushering in the new kingdom the new heaven and the new earth mm -hmm. okay um, let's go on to the Feast of Trumpets now it's called Rosh Hashanah uh, is there anything that we look at the New Testament that would be uh, is commonly uh, linked to Rosh Hashanah the Feast of Trumpets Well, of course, he's going to come with a with a trumpet call. When Jesus comes, it will be with the sound of a trumpet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's the that's a picture of the, the the return of Jesus. So, judgment, return, the second coming of Jesus. Then we go to the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement. I, there's a, obviously a difference between Day of Atonement and the Passover. We know that the Passover pictures Jesus' sac sacrifice for our sins, and the, the, the Passover was the blood on the doors to, to uh, have the angel of death pass over the firstborns. But what's the Day of Atonement then? Yom Kippur. That would be the actual resurrection, so three days after he died. Wouldn't it? Because that's when it was... That's when uh, you know everything was actually complete. I guess yeah. that's just my opinion. I don't know. What do you think? The Day of Atonement. Um, uh, that's that's Leviticus chapter sixteen, if I'm not mistaken. And the Day of Atonement was the day in which um, the high priest went into the holy of holies to um, confess the the national sins of of the nation and to um, sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat while setting the scapegoat out by the hand of a fit man to be led away out of the camp. Um, yeah, that's that's what the Day of Atonement is. To compare that to an event in the life of Christ, that will probably have to be after the resurrection um, when he and when he ascends up to heaven to apply the blood on the heavenly mercy seat in heaven as spoken of in Hebrews chapter 9 and 10 you know so so when Christ resurrects from the dead and um, he sees um, Mary and um, and Mary of course is Rabboni and goes to hug him and Jesus says to to her, you know, touch me not, for I have not yet to send it out to my father, but go tell uh, the brethren that I am here. And so he goes up and he comes back down. And when he comes back down is when he goes to visit the the disciples at the upper room, and he shows himself to them, having already sprinkled the burden of mercy seat in heaven. And I think that's what the Day of Atonement pictures in the life of Christ that that event up in heaven in which he acted as our great high priest mm. okay uh, all right I think we've covered the uh, uh, the festivals the blood sacrifices enough uh, let's cover one more thing here and then let's do a recap 
a real quick recap of all the points uh, from the beginning of our study. I'll uh, be back, guys. Just give me a second. Pardon me? Uh, I'll be back. Just continue, and I'll come back in a moment. Okay, all right. Uh, so let's talk about Jonah. Uh, what? Let me just read this, and then you can respond to this. It says, in a scene which prefigured the guards casting lots over Jesus' clothing, the sailors on the ship cast lots to see which of their number was responsible for the danger they were in. The lot fell to Jonah. Because of this, and at Jonah's suggestion, they threw him overboard. Jonah was condemned by Gentiles, and in their minds, killed to save the same Gentiles who had condemned him. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. <clears throat> That's just a little uh, explanation of what happened with Jonah. But uh, let's look what Jesus said about Jonah. He says uh, in Matthew 12, 39, Jesus answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Well, there's a couple of things here that, I've, uh, that I really hadn't thought about before. When it talks about them drawing lots on the ship, they had to draw lots, and uh, the lot fell to Jonah. And, uh, and then, of course, we know that Jesus, at the crucifixion, the soldiers drew lots to uh, uh, see who could would win his clothing. Uh, and then it says that at Jonah's suggestion, they threw him overboard. So Jonah was willing to be thrown overboard. Just as Jesus was willing. He didn't resist going to the cross. He was faithful to go to the cross. Uh, and Jonah was condemned by Gentiles, as Jesus was condemned by Gentiles, to save the Gentiles. And then uh, they took J Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. So as soon as he was thrown overboard, there was a sign that that was the solution to the problem. The reason they were going to be shipwrecked, the reason for this storm, was because of this Jonah. So once they threw him overboard, the sea became calm. Uh, and then we know what happened to Jonah after that. So, uh, who wants to talk about more about what actually happened to Jonah and what Jesus, how he compared uh, himself to Jonah? Hmm. Interesting. Um, the point here that looking at Jonah, remember Jonah was sent to not the Jews, mm -hmm. but to a pagan country of pigs compared to the Jews, and Jonah didn't want to go. The Jews didn't want would have been jealous of another nation. This Jewish prophet wanted Nineveh to be destroyed, didn't want to go and, and, and save and preach to Nineveh. So he was an unwilling prophet, but in the meantime, it was a good picture of the Jewish people and their jealousy towards the, the Gentiles. And Paul even spoke about the Gentiles coming into the kingdom wanting to provoke them to jealousy. So Jonah goes to Nineveh and preaches to Nineveh. And so Jesus comes and preaches, or he came to that who was his own. Jesus came to, this, to his own, and what did his own do? They rejected him. Yet, yet to those who accepted him, or to those who believed on him and even on his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. And so the sign of Jonah is saying, you, Jewish people, I'm the sign of Jonah to the, to the Gentiles. 
And here he comes, and the Jewish people, by and large, rejected their Messiah, and the, the message went out to Nineveh. Just as the message goes out into the world, yet the Jews, by and large, there's not many a Jew who will accept the message. And then Jonah gets very angry to the point where he wanted to die. When, when he comes and he, he's thirsty and he's, he's tired and God makes a tree pop up. He's still this wonderful tree. And he gets under this tree and he goes, oh, I can rest from the heat. And then God sends a worm to eat up the tree. He gets all upset. Well, you, you can't take my tree away. I'm so mad. Why are you angry? Well, because you took my tree and because you let these people be, you know, I came and, 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 I, and I actually, by my preaching, you saved, you saved them. And then the Lord goes, so did you have any right to be angry? I made this tree. This tree was my creation. Don't I have the right to, to put up a tree or take a tree away? And what about these people, Nineveh, that are my people? Shouldn't I have compassion on this city? So, um, so the sign of Jonah was basically a slap in the face to the Jewish people saying that, that I can have compassion on the Gentiles, but you stiff-necked, stubborn Jews will not listen to the truth. Your eyes will not be opened until the time comes. And because of the rejection of the Messiah by the Jews, remember that the gospel went to the Jew first, then the Gentile. If the Jews had not rejected the Messiah, then there would have been no Pentecost. There would have been no Holy Spirit going out throughout all the land because first the Jews had to reject the Messiah for the door to the Gentile for the door to the Gentiles to be opened up. Let me uh, ask a question here. Uh, how do you think? Do you think uh, Jonah? Uh, lived in the whale for three days? He lived in a fish that God created. He didn't say it was a whale. The, the, the fish, or whatever it was. This big fish, or whale, or whatever it was. Uh, almost every person I've ever talked to, whether they're a believer or a skeptic, they question, how, how could Jonah live in the whale, or fish, for three days? How could, How's that possible? And my, my answer is, the Jews, what Jesus is stating here, and I quoted him, is uh, the Jews, here, Jesus was healing cripples, giving sight to the blind, feeding the multitudes, doing all these miracles, and then they said they weren't going to believe him unless he gave them a sign. <laughs> After all these signs he's given them. Mm -hmm. And then he says they wanted him to perform a miracle right then, like on demand. Like, right now, perform a miracle, prove to us. So Jesus says, the only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale or the fish for three days, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days. This is Jesus said, pointing to his burial and resurrection. Absolutely. And that, this is why, uh, to me, uh, I've had a dispute with some people over the resurrection, what the meaning of, of purpose of the resurrection is. And the resurrection is the sign that Jesus promised to prove who he is. Absolutely. By being buried dead for three days and then raising himself from the dead, he proved he is God himself. He proved he has the power over life and death. Okay? So that was the proof. The cross is the remedy paid for our sins. There's no sin barrier. The resurrection was the sign that can give us confidence to trust Jesus. Why should I believe Jesus could give me eternal life? Well, the reason is the resurrection proves that he has power over life and death. Now I have confidence in trusting Jesus. It justifies putting our faith in Jesus because of the sign of the resurrection. So, if Jesus was dead in the tomb, and Jesus is comparing 
if his experience in a part of the earth for three days and three nights, comparing it to Jonah's experience, then I say Jonah was not alive in the fish. Jonah was dead in the fish. The only way this can be a real comparison is Jonah had to be dead and then resurrected out of the whale, just as Jesus was dead and then resurrected out of the tomb. That's very well possible. Um, he was definitely was a sign that he was swallowed up by the grave for three days. He did pray while he was in the belly, and God did uh, deliver him. But it got, Jesus Christ prayed on the cross, but he yet he died also. And had it not for it had it not been for 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 him being, uh, you know, um, in in the, the belly of the fish for three days. I, I've heard that somebody actually lived for three days, and I don't I don't believe it actually happened, but. Uh, and then spit out on the shore. He would have never. He would have never made it to the to, to, to Nineveh. So uh, he um, he may have been dead in there, but it doesn't say that he actually died in there. No, it does. It make a good comparison. The scriptures. The scriptures do not um, um, exact actually state that Jonah was a, a, alive or dead in the whale. It doesn't say until after a certain point. It didn't say that he died or it didn't say that he he was alive. He lived in the whale. Uh, if people just conclude whatever they want to conclude on this, but most people think that he was alive in the whale, and then they tried to come up with some scientific explanation of how could a person live in a fish for three days in order so that our faith is not based on something that's not scientific. And I say that we don't need to prove that he could live in the whale. I believe he was dead in the whale. And if we believe that the resurrection is possible, then I believe that the resurrection of Jonah was possible after he died in the whale. Absolutely. Okay, um, that really completes everything I wanted to cover in this study here. What I'd like to do in the remaining time is like speed reading. You know how you go cover something really fast? Uh, I'm going to cover the entire five videos in, a, in just a few minutes, just pointing to things, and each person make a, a very, very... 15 or 30 second statement on about each one of these things. We don't have, won't have time to go over every one, uh, every one of these points uh, in detail as we did originally, but to kind of recap everything. Okay, so the the whole point of this study is to kind of prove this saying: the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. It is almost as if the characters in the Old Testament are acting out a play, the meaning of which they are completely unaware. It is only the audience of the play, those who watch in light of the solid knowledge of the New Testament, who understand the meaning of the words of the events in the play. Uh, so this is what we're, the point we're, we're uh, trying to prove here, is that all through, some people argue that... Uh, the idea of our salvation through this blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross is a, is a brand new revelation, and it's only found in Paul's letters, and it's only found particularly uh, clearly in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. And, uh, that's, uh, and I've made videos pointing out that no, uh, it's all through the whole Bible. Uh, I started off this study pointing out examples of Jesus talking about, uh, it says, uh, In beginning at Moses and all the prophets, Jesus expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning him. That's Jesus on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection. And, and Jesus is talking to the, the Jews, and he said, ye, for, for had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. So we have two examples of Jesus proclaiming that the scriptures... And that was, that's all Old Testament at that time. All the Old Testament scriptures were all just talking about him. And then we have Paul. It says, And Paul, as was his manner, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. And of course, the only scriptures at that time were the Old Testament scriptures. And opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. So Paul had a custom of going every town, going to the synagogue, 
and going through these scriptures, showing the Jews all the scriptures that would point to this Savior that was going to come and die and be raised from the dead. So Jesus and Paul were emphasizing the scriptures. I'm all over Jesus. Said, I'm all through the Old Testament scriptures. And so for people to think that this um, message of our salvation through this blood sacrifice is a brand new thing, and no, it's all through the whole Bible. And we've cited examples. So we got the, the tree of life. The tree of life, Mitch, is a picture of Jesus on that cross. He is he is everlasting life. And the tree of life is Jesus. He's the one that gives us everlasting life. The tree of knowledge is the law. It, it condemns us. It teaches us right and wrong and condemns us. Uh, and now, uh, how about that coat of skins uh, that that uh, God gave Adam and Eve? Well, again, uh, a covering uh, of sin by the sacrifice of uh, a, a blood sacrifice of an animal. Yes. So, in other words, uh, here is the here is the uh, the problem. On one hand, you have man trying to remedy the problem. And then on the other hand, you have God saying, you can't solve the problem, I'll solve it for you. So Adam and Eve tried to cover up the fig leaves through their own works. And God says, that's not sufficient, I'll kill an animal, God's got to be shedding of blood, I'll cover you, and that's, that'll satisfy you. Okay? Uh, and then we have the example of Cain and Abel. And what was Cain's uh, sacrifice? The first efforts. That was the on the ground. Cain's sacrifice was given to God based upon the works of his hands. A farmer, he produced a crop. He said, "This look what I did. And God said, I'm not satisfied. You're trying to be justified by what you did. Uh, but no, uh, Abel gave God the sacrifice that he just satisfied. The death of an animal, symbolic of uh, Jesus dying for our sins. And then we got Abraham and Isaac. We got... Uh, uh, Isaac is the beloved son. This is Jesus is the beloved son. But when we got Isaac is laid on this wood, as Jesus was laid on the wooden cross. And can I say just one more thing about Isaac? Yeah. yeah. Um, also, you know, he was uh, a product of faith, and the other son was not. So. Do you see what I'm saying? The, the, so the um, so Isaac wasn't like basically a work of hand either. He was someone yes, I, given I, to I, him Isaac, by God. Isaac yeah. was the miracle God promised uh, Abraham and Sarah in their old age. He promised them they'd have a son. Now they tried to, again. Here's another example of man's work and God's work. Abraham and Sarah tried to say. God, I don't have faith in God to provide us a child. Let's take this into our own hands. We'll solve the problem. We'll have Hagar provide the child. And then God didn't accept that. That's man trying to solve the problem. But God came through, was faithful, and he gave them a child in their old age, and that's Isaac. So Isaac, the only, this says here, thine only son, in Genesis 22, it says Abraham, Isaac was his only son. Just as Jesus is our the only son of begotten Son of God, and then he was laid on the wood. As Jesus was laid on the wood to be a sacrifice, and then it says, "And Abraham said, My son, God will provide Himself a lamb. God will provide Himself a lamb. That means that to me, God will provide Himself as a lamb. And then." Uh, how about Salam when this when the ram was caught in the thicket? God provided the, the lamb to replace uh, to be uh, in, instead of Isaac. He was caught in the thicket by his horns. And what did we see that was represent? Uh, yeah, it re represents the, um, the crown of thorns uh, yes. placed on Christ's head. Yes. Here we have Jesus with this crown of thorns on his head, and he's our sacrifice. And here we have God providing a sacrifice, and his horns are caught in the thorns so that Abraham could get him, and that represents the crown of the thorns. Uh, and, and then we go to, uh, 
we're doing a speed reading course here. Uh, and then we got Joseph. Joseph was in the whale. What was that picture of? Uh, Joseph was in the well. Yeah, in the well. In the whale, the same thing. Same thing as Jonah. What's the picture of? <laughs> whale or well. He was he was in that well, and then he came out of the well. So we see that as a picture of what? Uh, uh, again, the death, burial, and resurrection. And of course, even the well from Jesus comes the well that springs forward of eternal life. Exactly. <coughs> so uh, Jacob thought that Joseph was dead. He was mourning over him. So here he is, he sees him as dead, and then he comes and he's back alive again. It's the picture of the resurrection of, of uh, Jesus. Uh, and then we go, the water and the rock with, with Moses. Now, I, so all of them, I'm glad you added that when we went over this the first time. Um, God told Moses to strike a rock, and, and he would provide water for the people so they could uh, be saved from dying from lack of water. And Moses struck the water, the rock, and the water came out. Well we now what we what do we see the rock compared to? Um the smitten rock uh, Christ yes. small smitten once for our sins. Jesus is is the rock, the foundation of our salvation. And, and he was smitten once, and water and blood came out of his side, and and Moses smote the rock once, and he succeeded. And then on a, on a second event, God told Moses to believe that the rock would give him water, and guess what? Moses didn't believe him. He struck the rock again. Instead of just believing, he decided to do it himself. And by doing it himself, it's a lack of faith in God. And God said, because you didn't believe me, I'm going to not let you go into the promised land. So, see, Jesus had his, his spirit one time. God didn't want that picture of, of the, the spear in Jesus' side spoiled by Moses smiting it again and again. And then we got... Uh, Jesus, uh, you know, in the, in the desert, you know, you had um, uh, the bread provided from uh, manna in heaven. Jesus is the bread of life. You got the water coming out of the rock. Jesus is the living water. Uh, you got the dove come down from heaven, provided for meat, and Jesus gave his body as a sacrifice for us. So you got all these examples, and then we got the Sabbath day rest. What about the serpent on the on the pole, Mitch? Absolutely, another picture of Christ being sin for us. Yes, and Jesus said, just as uh, Moses lifted up the brazen serpent on the pole, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, and uh, in that manner I will draw all men to myself. So you have Moses. Now, uh, Scott pointed out something to me in a conversation with him a couple of weeks ago that we neglected to cover. Do you remember Moses in the, um, in the battle holding up his arms and then... When his arms drop down, they would lose, and when right. his arms went up, he'd be raised. So here you have Moses in a position, picture of the cross, and as long as uh, he's in that position, there's victory. As soon as he comes down, they lose. So we have another picture of victory through this death on the cross. Uh, and then, uh, and then, what about the tearing of the veil? The veil in the Old Testament. What represented what in the tabernacle and in the temple? Well, that was the holy of holies, the the inner the inner sanctuary, if you will. Yeah. And uh, that that rep that nobody could go into that holy sanctuary without blood. Well, only one person could go in. Only one there? person could go in there, and if he and if he wasn't worthy, they put a string and bells on him because he would have been pulled out. He's that curtain was torn that opened up the 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 passageway, if you will, through the flames of the law, which I, I akin to the, the flames on the holy mountain, into the holy mountain, the promised land. Yeah. So this veil in the temple 
was a, a barrier separating man from God. Man did not have access to God. That veil represented the barrier. And when Jesus died on the cross, the veil was torn in half, and the barrier was wide open. No more barrier. Sin was not an obstacle separating man from God because Jesus paid for our sin. Um, and then, uh, over and over again, we have examples of Paul talking about how uh, the Old Testament was a picture or a shadow uh, of, of uh, the New Testament. Uh, and then, uh, okay, that pretty much gets us caught up, kind of recapping everything. So, uh, I'm going to give everybody a chance to kind of sum up their own thoughts on this. Uh, and then and I'll, I'll make a closing remark here, and then we'll be done with this series. And then I want to talk to everybody uh, after we get off here about the topic for next next time. Okay, uh, uh, keeping everything in mind and the whole premise of the of this uh, lesson, the study, uh, give a little a synopsis in your own words of, of this. Uh, we'll start with Mitch. Hey, do you mind if I go first real quick? Because i got to get going. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, my daughter starts school tomorrow, so I've got stuff. I just think this series has been wonderful, especially this one, because it kind of sums up everything. Um, and I just uh, I think it's beautiful and amazing because it, it testifies to how awesome God is and how he how he works and how he can just, uh, he's just amazing. And what we covered in this series is one of the reasons why I trust God so much and one of the reasons it, it drew me to him is because I could look and see Jesus throughout the whole entire Bible. That was important to me because I had to make sure that you know I wasn't being deceived by the Bible. I had to, you know, because you never know. So I was like, what are, you know, got to check it out, and I did, and I saw what you're talking about, and and it helped me, and um, so I think it's really great that, that you did this series. I think it's going to help a lot of people, and uh, I have a Jewish friend who I absolutely love, who I'm going to be sending this video to, because we kind of combine everything all in this one video, so okay. he knows who I'm talking about if he watches this, so hey, buddy. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Tanya, and uh, feel free if you need to go now. Uh, good night. I'll talk to you All again right. before next week. Okay, uh, good night, guys. Love you. <coughs> yeah. Bye. Okay, Salam. Uh, Salam, do you want to kind of sum up uh, your thoughts on this subject? Yeah. Um, you know, I think I think when we look at our, our Bibles, um, you know, sometimes we can think it's just a a jump it's just a mess of books and with no clear kind of pattern it's just books that were compiled together and placed for the benefits of us but um, looking at this series we see that um, you know nothing nothing in the Bible is coincidental or, or incidental and everything has a, a reason there's there's a reason for everything, and when we look at the Old Testament specifically, in light of what we've been looking at um, over these past couple of weeks, it's just to see that um, God always has a plan, and everything God does comes to pass. It doesn't matter how much years have gone by; if God has said it to be so then it will come to pass and we've seen this countless times and um, we see the, the constant foreshadowings of the things to come hundreds of years before it happened and so what I've taken this series the most is just that um, God, is faith, God is faithful and he keeps his promises and he, it will always come to pass Will always come to pass, and I just thank the Lord for preserving His word for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, brother. Thank you so much. And, and Mitch, uh, what are you I need to go myself. Okay, brother. I'll I'll, uh, I'll send you a note about the topic for next uh, next well, week. Take care, right. Mitch. Take okay. care. Good. All right. Bless you, brother. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye.
Well, now, okay. Oh, overall, really good. I think uh, we had a lot of points. Um, you know, basically uh, uh, summing it all up, I mean, looking at, at the beginning, you've got to look at, at the garden. First place you have to look is the tree of life and the, what this, the name of this fruit was. It was the, the knowledge of good and evil. It was ethics, basically. It was, it was, it was a moral code. And it, uh, it, it, it gave rise for man to exalt himself in his own morality and then morality to become perverted and, uh, and for power to happen. And this was the picture of Satan. He was the, he was the one that, um, that, that was the, the, the prosecuting attorney, if you will. And then looking at what happened with, this, with Adam and Eve, that they ate of this fruit and they were naked. And shame came. And so you look at all of this, and then you look at the tree of life, and you look at all the things that happened over the, over, over the centuries with the Jewish people from, uh, you know, from the beginning. But we look at Abraham and Isaac, huge picture of a father sacrificing his son and the nation of Israel, Jacob, coming out of that, the chosen nation. We, we look at Moses and the, and the Passover lamb, and we look at the, the correlation between Christ and Yeshua leading them into the promised land. And so many more examples from Joseph becoming second to Pharaoh and Jesus sitting at the right hand of, 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 of the Father himself, Hashem himself. So we see all of these pictures and that they are there in the Old Testament. And one of my favorite ones is, is, is Zechariah 12, 10. Uh, they will look upon him whom they pierced, and they will mourn for him as a firstborn son. I mean, that's you mean, big. Uh, David wrote about it in the Psalms. So any person who comes to the New Testament and is blind to the idea that the Old Testament didn't, didn't foreshadow it, and the, and, the, and the wonderful thing, maybe not so much for the Jews that rejected it, was that it was hidden from those, the prophets that wrote about it. As the events happened, people didn't see it. It was hidden. But then when it came to pass, it all matched. It all, it all interlaced with itself and married the concept of the tree of life now coming back to the cross. Perfect picture. Amen. Well, I, I would say to everybody that we started this show on the premise that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And we went through the Old Testament. Uh, there's a lot, of things, a lot of things we probably neglected to cover in this study. But we gave example after example after example that, of things in the Old Testament that were really like, um, as Paul says here, your shadows, your um, prefigures of Christ and the blood atonement. So we gave you many, many examples to make that point. So uh, concealed within the Old Testament is Jesus and his blood sacrifice. And then, so we can't, you can't really understand the Old Testament unless you understand, uh, read the New Testament and understand it first and look back at the Old Testament through that lens, the New Testament. And I would say that uh, for those of you who have just studied the New Testament, uh, you will far better appreciate the New Testament if you, if you study the Old Testament in light of the New. Uh, and as Tanya said, I think one of the great lessons to be gained from all this is this is just further evidence that the Bible is the Word of God, that the, uh, this, is, uh, this is proof of the, uh, the, the, the truth of the Bible. So uh, these are not as Brother Salam said, uh, coincidences. <laughs> okay, Brother Mitch, uh, I'm going to close the show here, and then I'll talk to you privately for a few minutes. And then, uh, But uh, everybody who's watching this, uh, we gave you a lot of information in this series, and uh, but the most important information you need to know is really simple. It's so simple a little child could understand it. And, and, and that is that I want you to know that Man's situation is hopeless. We're in a hopeless, hopeless situation. And that's why God had to come to our rescue. He became a man in Jesus Christ. He died on a cross. He paid for all of our sins. 
Now sin is not a barrier between man and God anymore. You have access to God, and Jesus is, is, has his arms reaching out ready to embrace you, and he has a gift for you waiting if you'll receive it. It's eternal life in the kingdom of God. He'll give it to you freely if you come to him for it. He's the only way you can get it. If you put your faith completely in him, reject religion as the solution. Reject your own performance uh, as a way of uh, satisfying God. And instead, humble yourself and call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and rely completely on him. He will give you eternal life as a free gift. So please do that now. And if you, if you do, then please make a comment. We'd love to know that uh, through this study, uh, you came to know the truth and embrace Jesus as your Savior. Bless you all. In the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.